Hey Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales and I am bringing you the one you've been waiting for. This is the last screencast session for the unit called the Cellular Basis of Life. Screencast session 8. This screencast focuses on active transport and there are two major types of active transport we'll talk about. Now as we get, begin this uh, screencast, please make sure that you've got your two column notes paper so you can take down some notes. Also, I'll be referring to diagrams that are on pages 119 and 120 in your unit booklet. Learning targets for screencast session number eight. Uh, first thing you should be able to do is distinguish between passive and active transport. How is active transport different? What makes it special? You should be able to define active transport. Along with defining active transport, you should be able to list at least two examples of active transport. You should be able to list and describe various types of membrane protein channel assisted active transport. We'll talk about some examples in the screencast. And you should be able to describe and sketch the processes of exocytosis and then there's two specific examples of what is called endocytosis and that includes pinocytosis and phagocytosis. The textbook reference for this screencast is chapter 3 section 4. Uh, for those of you that like to use the textbook that's on active uh, transport as opposed to passive transport. All right, so we'll begin just simply with an overview of active transport. Uh, active transport can be defined as transport that requires the cell to use energy, and that energy is in the form of ATP. So why does the cell have to expend energy? Well, we talked about passive transport following the natural tendency for molecules, and that natural tendency is for molecules to spread out from high concentration to low concentration uh, or to diffuse. The reason that diffusion occurs is related to the second law of thermodynamics, which is that all molecules are subject to increasing disorder in systems, and that's called entropy. So when you consider that when, organ when molecules are in high concentration, they tend to be more highly ordered. As they spread out, they become more disordered. That's entropy. That's the natural tendency. So passive transport doesn't require energy. If you're going to fight entropy, if you're going to uh, move against the natural tendency, you have to use energy, and that's why active transport requires an input of ATP. Big idea is that substances will move against their natural tendency from low concentration to high concentration. Now, why would a cell need to do active transport? Well, there are a couple of reasons that we'll talk about. One would be if a cell needs to take up materials or nutrients that are relatively scarce in their cellular environment. If you have a cell that needs to take in an essential ion, for instance, and that ion is in relatively low concentration in the extracellular environment, uh, it can use an ATP-powered pump to bring that ion into the cell against the normal concentration gradient. Another reason that active transport is used by cells is really just to maintain concentration gradients themselves. There's a, a picture here that we see on the right-hand side. This picture shows a cell. And here's the cell membrane here. Here's the extracellular environment. Here's the cytoplasm. Uh, the cytoplasm is shown as having a pH of 7. And you'll recall from an earlier unit that pH is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. We can see these little plus signs indicate hydrogen ions. So at a pH of 7, um, <clears throat> there's relatively few hydrogen ions in this uh, cytoplasm here. The lysosome has a pH of 5. Now, when you decrease the pH, you're actually increasing the number of hydrogen ions. So the lysosome has a relatively high concentration of hydrogen ions. The reason for that is the lysosome contains uh, hydrolytic enzymes that are involved in breaking down cellular substances, and those hydrolytic enzymes work best at lower pH values. So for the lysosome to function correctly, it needs to maintain a fairly steep concentration gradient. It needs to maintain a fairly high level of hydrogen ions on the inside of that structure as opposed to the outside. Now the natural tendency, of course, will be for these hydrogen ions to diffuse from high concentration inside the lysosome to lower concentration outside the lysosome. Active transport allows for the constant maintenance of this fairly steep concentration gradient. Now another example of um, uh, uh, active transport that would involve that kind of movement is something called an ATP-powered pump. And we're going to look specifically at a sodium-potassium pump. The lysosomal pump is really a proton pump like you see over here. We're going to look at a special example called the sodium-potassium pump. 
Uh, and then a final example of active transport that we'll spend a few minutes with is called bulk transport. And that's moving large quantities or large particles across the membrane. And there's two really two major types of bulk transport. You have endocytosis and exocytosis. Endo being into the cell, exo being out of the cell. All right, the first uh, specific example of uh, active transport we're going to look at involves membrane uh, assisted protein channel active transport. And I know that's a mouthful. Basically, this is active transport that involves membrane proteins. And you can see here membrane proteins that are embedded in the membrane of this cell. This cell happens to be a nerve cell. So the specific example is the sodium potassium pump, and that uses transport proteins to pump ions against the concentration gradient. It does this to help maintain a concentration gradient and actually something called an electrochemical gradient and that is really important for the transmission of nerve impulses. So I'm going to go around the um, cell here so you can see what's actually happening. So we begin with um, the important ions on, involved here. Sodium ions which are found in, in this example we're looking at them inside the cytoplasm of the cell and then we have potassium ions which are found here in, in the extracellular environment. Sodium ions, Na+, will bind to the cytoplasmic side of this protein uh, that's embedded in the membrane. And when that happens, when those three sodium ions are bound there, it uh, triggers the release of a phosphate from an ATP. And what happens is we call phosphorylation. The phosphate is added onto that protein or phosphorylates it. And the result of that phosphorylation is that the little energy that's released from the ATP can be used to change the shape of the protein. You'll notice that the protein at the beginning is facing the opening. The opening is towards the cytoplasm of the cell. So those three sodium ions are attached to the protein and what they do when the ATP releases that energy, the conformation of the protein, the shape of the protein changes. So now the opening is facing the extracellular environment. Those three sodium ions then are released into the extracellular environment and that conformational change now the fact that this opening is facing the cytoplasm or rather facing the extracellular environment uh, allows some potassium ions to be bound. Now notice that there's only two potassium ions that will be bound for every three that are uh, sodium ions that are leaving the cell. Those potassium ions once they bind what that ha what happens is it triggers the release of that phosphate group when the phosphate group is released another conformational change takes place. So the, the opening of that protein, which was facing the extracellular environment, now faces the cytoplasm, and the potassium ions can leave. When the potassium ions have left, that leaves the sodium receptor sites open, and the whole cycle can repeat again. So in essence, what's occurring here is we're pumping sodium uh, out of the cell against the concentration gradient, and we're pumping potassium into the cell against the concentration gradient. And the big idea here is that we're producing an overall difference in electrical charge because we're going to end up with lots of positive sodium uh, on the outside relative to the number of positive uh, potassium ions that are on the inside. So we end up with what's called an electrochemical gradient. Chemical because it involves these chemical uh, atoms or these ions, sodium ion and potassium ion but electro, electro because it relates to the charge. There's overall there will be more positive charge on the outside because you're pumping three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions that are pumped in. Now this is really critical for the transmission of nerve impulses that relies on that electrochemical potential. When we get together in class we'll be looking at a, a really great animation that shows how ner nerve impulses are transmitted along the length of this um, type of cell. All right, the other major type of active transport is referred to as bulk transport. And bulk transport can be broken down into two major types of transport. Exocytosis is removing large particles from the cell. And the way that happens is you have a large particle that is uh, contained in a vesicle. This could be the result of a protein that's produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then packaged in the Golgi apparatus into a vesicle. Here you see these <clears throat> protein molecules and then the vesicle around it. The vesicle generally will fuse with the membrane uh, 
and then the whole uh, vesicle membrane complex sort of opens up to the outside of the cell and those large particles would be expelled to the outside of the cell. This might happen, for instance, in related to those nerve impulses that we talked about with the uh, sodium potassium pump. When the nerve impulse reaches the end of one cell, there are special proteins called neurotransmitters that are released by um, the cell. And the way that they're released is through exocytosis. You get these neurotransmitters that are packaged up in vesicles. The vesicle fuses with the end of one cell's membrane, right? Releases them into what's called the synapse or the space between two nerve cells. The way those neurotransmitters would be taken up might be endocytosis. Uh, endocytosis is essentially the opposite, and you'll see a picture of that here. Endocytosis involves taking in larger particles. Endo means into. So taking in larger particles by having the membrane wrap around those particles, form a vesicle, and then taking those large particles into the cell. A couple of different types of endocytosis. And by the way, this picture you'll see on uh, page 120, the sodium potassium pump picture that we just looked at was on page 119. Here you have what's referred to as cell eating or cellular eating. It's phagocytosis. That's a type of endocytosis. And that is when a solid particle, a food particle, for instance, is engulfed by the cell. The cell produces what are called the pseudopods, false feet that wrap around the substance. The whole membrane then engulfs that substance, taking it in, in this case, as a food vacuole. That food vacuole then might uh, bind with a lysosome for digestion. Pinocytosis is also known as cell drinking. This is taking in a large quantity of uh, dissolved substance that's a substance that's dissolved in a liquid. Uh, same thing happens. The cell would wrap around that liquid, forming a vesicle, and then the contents of that vesicle could be digested at a, a lysosome. Now, a special type of endocytosis is called receptor-mediated endocytosis, and that's where there are special types of receptor proteins found on the interior surface here of a what's called a pit or a coated pit. When those uh, chemicals bind to the receptor proteins, that signals for endocytosis to occur, and that just allows for um, particular chemicals to be brought in when they're um, present in the cellular environment. So the big idea, get it, bulk transport, big idea. The big idea of bulk transport is that you're taking large substances either by uh, you know, wrapping the membrane around them or you're expelling large substances by having the vesicle fuse with the membrane and then expel them out. And the big idea of active transport is that we're using energy and we're moving substances against the concentration gradient. All right, so if you've got questions, make sure you bring them into class with you and we'll see you again next time in biology.